Hi everyone. I want to thank you for coming to listen to my discussion today about pediatric abdominal ultrasound applications. Three applications I'm going to discuss today are intussusception, appendicitis, and pyloric stenosis. I've grouped these applications together as they share a number of features. The patients, the scanning approach, and the structures that are used to identify the pathologies. Now you may have heard that these are difficult studies to perform, but the evidence shows that these applications can be learned and performed by the emergency physician with a high degree of sensitivity and specificity. Now often for these applications, children present hopefully looking like this, and our job is to maximize their comfort, prevent them from turning into this. The easiest way to do that is to warm the gel. Now, often we tell patients before we do our ultrasound, ooh, sorry, this is cold, but we don't really do very much about it. However, in these young children, putting cold gel in their belly means that we've lost all their cooperation and they're very uncomfortable. So we have one of these small portable gel warmers right in, emergen in our emergency department, right next to the ultrasound machine. Once I plan on taking the machine into the patient's room, I just grab the warm gel, bring it right into the room, and it makes a, a world of difference. The additional thing has to do with position of comfort. All we often do is have the parent lie down first, and then the child lay down, belly up. That way they can feel their parent right beneath them, and the parents can assist with some holding and some more comfort position. For all three of these applications, we're going to start with a high-frequency linear probe. Personally, I prefer the wider probe, as it gives a much wider field of view and with a greater depth. However, if these are not available to you, then a curvilinear probe is perfectly well suited to do all these applications. In addition, for some of the bigger children where we have to go through more soft tissue, particularly with appendicitis, then the curvilinear probe is perfectly well suited for this application. First one we're going to talk about is interception. Now what I'm going to ask you to remember is 2.5. Keep this in your mind and I'm going to define it as we make our way through this section. We talk about ileocolic intussusception. The standard presentation or the one that we hear most often about is the child who has intermittent crampy abdominal pain, vomiting, and current jelly stools. However, this classic triad only occurs in about 20% of patients. So it's not the most common presentation. What that simply means is we must have a high index of suspicion. Children will present with any of these symptoms and using our portable ultrasound, we can investigate very nicely with ileocolic for ileocolic intussusception. The starting position is with the high frequency linear probe, the transverse plane with the marker pointed toward the patient's right, right above the pubic symphysis, angle down into the pelvis. And that's going to give us a nice view of the bladder. That's what we see first here. Remember, however, since we have a relatively shallow depth, most of these children are relatively young, we're not going to see the entire bladder itself. So you have to get accustomed to just seeing the most superficial part of the bladder. You can, of course, deepen your depth, get a full view of the bladder, and then shallow back up. Now our next step is to move that probe over to the patient's right side. But what this view of the bladder does is it puts us at the appropriate transverse level. So keeping it with the view of the bladder, slide over to the right side. We're going to bring the iliac vessels into view. In addition, we're also going to be able to see the psoas muscle, which looks like a stick, like striated appearance, just over toward the patient's right lower quadrant. So imagine we have our child here. You're going to envision the intestine lying right over in the abdomen. And then our goal, once we identify those iliac vessels, we're going to slide over and we're going to see that psoas muscle. Living just above the psoas muscle is going to be the cecum, and that's going to be our starting point as we move our way up the right upper, the right side to the ascending colon. And then once we identify the gallbladder, that says to us that we've made it to the hepatic flexure. We're going to rotate the probe so that the marker points toward the patient's head. Scan across the transverse colon. Rotate back so that the marker appears once again on the patient's right side. Scan down the descending colon. I'm going to show you in slow-mo what this appears as. 
And this at first is going to appear as nothing in particular, but there's five really important things we're going to see on this normal bowel ultrasound. The first is air. Then we're going to make our three water, poop, bowel, and peristalsis. I'm going to speed this uh, video up here and I'm going to identify those normal findings for you. As you march your way up, you're going to give some graded compression, a little bit of squeeze down toward the patient's back. What that's going to do is eliminate some of that overlying soft tissue and also any of that uh, bowel air to give us a good visualization of the bowel wall itself and peristalsis. So everyone's getting a little comfortable with this. I'm going to bring it into real speed for you. Things are moving a little bit faster. And remember, our first thing that we're going to identify is air. So air is going to appear those hyperechoic lines that we're used to seeing when we're evaluating the chest for something like a pneumothorax. I'm going to freeze this image for you right here. You'll be able to identify that we can see these hyperechoic lines. And those are the air pattern right here that we identify. In addition, air can also appear as these hyperechoic dots right here on the screen. Those are often contained really nicely and well seen within the bowel itself. In addition, what ends up happening is you can get a nice view of the fluid that's contained within the bowel. Let's let this video run here. You can see some of that black that's going to appear. That says right in this space right here, this black right here, that's fluid within the bowel, totally normal. As we march our way through, particularly on the left side, we're going to see more of that, that stool as it develops. That's going to have more of a hyperechoic appearance, some grayish clumpy material. And then we're going to see the bowel wall itself. So let's let this run again. And the bowel wall is going to look just like what you imagine it's going to appear like right here. So here's that bowel wall right there. See we have sort of a loop of bowel that appears on end. And then as you keep your hand nice and steady, you're going to see some peristalsis. Everything is moving and tumbling. Now that's a normal section of bowel. As we march our way up, think about it kind of like you're doing a scan for a AAA. You're going to push and move to each further section along the bowel wall length. So try to identify those five things which are normal. In contrast, if you pick up someone who has intussusception, what we end up seeing here is just this targetoid or circular appearance as one piece of the bowel pushes into the other section of the bowel. So this has that target or circular-like appearance with an outer wall, middle, and inner wall itself. Now it's called that target sign. I think about it more like a cinnamon roll sign because I think I can see that spin and move in through. Now remember at the very, very beginning of this presentation for intussusception, I said that you need to remember that 2.5. What that helps us define is the minimum number in terms of length for ileocolic intussusception. Now, if you see something that's smaller than that, it has an appearance sort of like this, then you're definitely looking at something that's small bowel. Now, the most common application we're going to identify this ileocolic intussusception is in the right upper quadrant. That's why I highlighted for you on the first video that I was going half speed that gallbladder right there. As you march your way up and you identify that gallbladder that says that you're in the hepatic flexure and then your eyes should pay particular attention to that little region. So a little trick that I do is I do my scan as I've described, marching all the way up ascending colon, rotating the probe all the way across transverse colon, rotating back down, descending colon, and then I do one more double check right in the right upper quadrant because I know that's the most likely place where we can identify ileocolic intussusception. Getting back to this piece that I described to you before, remember that 2.5 centimeters is the minimum number that you're going to need to identify ileocolic intussusception. I'm going to show you here just what looks like normal peristalsis. And what we're seeing is probably some small bowel. And I'd like to freeze this image for you. Because there's one point that if you just saw a still image, you might be tricked to sort of say, could something like this be ileocolic interception? You're going to have to remember that 2.5 centimeter rule because we can see here that this is definitely less than 2.5 centimeters as we've listed here on the right side of the screen that the whole screen is 3.1 centimeters. If you ever think that something is 
small bow, small bow in a deception. Give your hand a little bit of a rest. Don't move at all. See if that image on the screen just moves out of view. That says to you that that's small bow, small bow in a deception. In addition, what you can do is provide a little bit of downward pressure. See if you can squeeze that small bow, small bow in a deception out of the way. And small bow, small bow in a deception is rarely pathological, something that is routinely seen and really pretty transient. So after just a little bit of instruction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video, see if we can identify, identify normal or abnormal, and whether you see iliocolic intussusception. Let this video run for you here in your minds. Identify what it is that you're looking for. And right there, that's where we see the iliocolic intussusception. And I want to let this run because there's a couple of interesting things that appear here. Remember we talked about that those hyperechoic lines? Well, that's right here. That's a normal section. And right in this corner, right up on top of the screen, we can see a little glimpse of gallbladder. So this says to me, I'm in the right upper quadrant, the most likely place to identify iliocolic interception. I should pay particular attention to this region right here. So let this run one or two more times to bring it into better view. And then right here, we see that targetoid appearance of that cinnamon roll. That's the iliocolic interception. We're going to freeze this image for you right here. You're going to identify that we can see the gallbladder right here. Remember, highlighting the location, that's a particular level of importance. Let this video run one more time. See the air, we start to see a circular appearance, that cinnamon roll, and then bang, right there. That's that target, or it also looks to me like a big sushi roll. That's that iliocolic interception. That is what we're looking for. So most of the images that I showed you before were using the wider high frequency of linear probe. These two, however, are with a narrower high frequency of linear probe. You can see what they show is that as you go deeper on the screen and deeper in the body, we narrow our field of view. In that particular case, we can see that you can't visualize the entire interception on the screen. So your eye simply has to get used to the fact that you're going to only get part of that cinnamon roll or target appearance. And it obviously is much, much wider. So if you were to measure, consider how much deeper this would go and how much wider it would go on the screen. This one on the right side, I show you that we're in the right upper quadrant as identified by the gallbladder. And then we can see that interception extending off to the right of the screen. So naturally you'd shift over to the right, give yourself a better field of view. However, in something like this, you may very well consider using the curvilinear probe. Gives it that much wider field of view. However, what you can see in this is that it's not quite as crystal clear as the prior images we've seen. But what it does provide for you is a nice frame of reference and the structures that are sort of neighboring and nearby. In addition, you'll be able to identify that complete iliocolic interception on the screen with the inner, middle, and outer walls. Another thing that's identified on iliocolic interception is referred to as either a pseudo kidney sign or a double kidney sign. And I'll let this run for you and then I'll describe to you why that's the case. So you can see we're using a curvilinear probe here. Let this run for you here. And then go through a couple more details. So I'm going to freeze this right for you. You can see, as, of course, as we go lower on the screen, it's deeper in the body. We're getting a nice cross-sectional view here of the kidney with its hyperechoic rim. And then right up here in the right upper quadrant, we can see the beginnings of iliocolic interception. Now at first, particularly with this curvilinear probe, we see the outer rim, which is hyperechoic, very similar, I think in some people's representation, of the kidney. So that's why it's called a pseudo-kidney sign. If you're lucky enough to pick up the iliocolic interception and the kidney in view, that's why it's described as the double kidney sign. Let's let this run and we'll see some really important features. Freeze this here. We can bring the liver into view here. And then we're going to be able to see the gallbladder. Remember, that's going to tell us that we're in the right upper quadrant. Get a really nice visualization. And let this run through here. We can see a really good visualization right about there of that iliocolic intussusception, that circular targetoid appearance. All right. Now, 
One other thing that may very well present with intermittent colicky abdominal pain is gastroenteritis. And of course, that's on the list as part of our differential diagnosis. But before we do any imaging, we might not be able to determine whether this child simply has the beginnings of gastroenteritis with just vomiting and we haven't seen diarrhea yet, or whether this child has intussusception. So here's a nice picture of gastroenteritis. We can imagine in those particular circumstances that you have dilated large bowel. You can see here we're in the right upper quadrant is identified by the gallbladder. This is transverse colon which is really dilated. We can see the haustral markings and those hyperechoic dots representing air that are really well visualized because we have fluid in the background. So this is the sonographic visualization of gastroenteritis. This makes me feel even better. I, didn't, I simply didn't uh, identify the child as not ileocolic interception, but I'm able to sort of say, that your child has gastroenteritis and may very well have some diarrhea tomorrow because I can see some dilated large bowel. That makes me and the parents feel much, much better. There's a couple of things that can uh, make visualization a little tricky. Stool, particularly on the curvilinear probe, may have a semicircular or circular appearance with multiple layers. Remember, in those circumstances, what you can do is change over to a high-frequency linear probe to get that improved visualization. Bowel disease, like inflammatory bowel disease, will cause some thickening of the bowel wall. That shouldn't give that circular targetoid appearance, but what it might do is give you a little bit of blurring or a thicker bowel wall than you're used to. And we talked a little bit about small bowel, small bowel in a susception. It can be a little bit confusing. Remember to identify where you are on the patient and use that two and a half centimeters to sort of identify the minimum uh, size of ileocolic interception. However, if you have overlying bowel gas that you haven't been able to push out, that's going to definitely interfere with your ability to identify ileocolic interception. Next, I'd like to move on to appendicitis. And you're going to need to remember six to seven as part of this part of the presentation. So let's go on. And for Appendicitis, we're often faced with children in significant abdominal pain and using a probe providing a lot of downward pressure is going to make visualization very, very difficult and make them very uncomfortable. So for these studies, morphine is going to really change that uh, course of the evaluation, make the child more comfortable. Remember that morphine is definitely not going to interfere with the evaluation examination, doesn't change the uh, the physical exam itself and will definitely make your study easier to perform. So we talked about six to seven as one and the other thing I really need to remember is this concept of graded compression. So what I mean by that is here's using a high frequency linear probe to try to identify the appendix but we have some pretty good visualization of that soft tissue. What we need to do is squish out that soft tissue, any overlying bowel gas, to try to get nice visualization of the appendix. So what we mean is a little bit down recompression is going to squeeze that soft tissue, squeeze that muscular layer, and improve our visualization of the areas that we need to identify. So here's our appendix. Think about this. Remember it comes right off the cecum. And most of the time it's drawn like this as if it just peaks down a little bit. But in lots and lots of different people, we know that its orientation can vary. And it can be something like this up here. It can extend even further over. It can be even longer. Sometimes it irritates the bladder and causes more dysuria or may get flipped up a little bit. So this is going to really change the way when we start to look for the appendix whether it's going to appear as a tube, like a flattened tube, or a circle, depending upon how we cut that pro, how we cut the appendix. So here is a visualization of a normal appendix. We have uh, identified here our iliac vessels, and then you can see that the appendix, it sort of is like a snake that just drapes over. I think it also looks a little bit like the balloons they use to create balloon animals. Let's give that view again. Here's a video moving on the left. 
we can see those iliac vessels just below the normal appendix. You have to train your eye to look for a sort of a flattened tubular structure, like that balloon for the balloon animals, or like a snake as it just drapes its head right over. The two most common applications where we can identify both a normal and abnormal appendix are in the area of the psoas muscle, around or just over the psoas muscle, just below or just above the iliac vessels. So as we perform this very programmed search, you're going to use these two locations as your main points of identification. So let's start with that patient here, and I'm going to give you a really systematic approach to try to find the appendix. Now remember, for the most part, the appendix is going to live within a box contained in the right lower quadrant. We're going to define the floor of that box, just like we did for iliocolic interception. We identified the bladder. Our high frequency linear probe is going to be placed in the mid point low, just over the pubic symphysis, marker pointed toward the right. And we're going to slide our probe over to the patient's right, identify those iliac vessels, slide even further right, identify the psoas muscle, and then identifying the most lateral border of this square box with the iliac crest. Here's the views that we have, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start to raise the edge of that box and define its most superior border. We're going to go up the ascending colon, up to the level of the umbilicus, continue over across, and within this box in the right lower quadrant is where we're going to search. So we now will create up and down over the psoas muscle and those iliac vessels and performed our search. So let's begin the approach. We can see our bladder, same sort of visualization we had. Remember when we did that systematic search for iliocolic interception. This is why I like to think of these two applications, iliocolic interception and appendicitis together because the beginning approach is very similar. Slide over to the right, we identify our iliac vessels. That striated psoas muscle is just over laterally. And next we see the hyperco curvature that is the iliac crest. Now remember, right in this region between the psoas muscle and those vessels, right around here is where the cecum is going to live. Cecum is important because off the cecum is where the appendix will begin. So here, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Here's our psoas muscle, that striated muscular appearance, outlined in yellow. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the probe still in that transverse plane and provide some graded compression. We're going to slide down over the psoas muscle toward the patient's feet and then using more squishing out to get rid of that overlying bowel gas and any soft tissue to try to squeeze it down. We're going to go up to the level of the umbilicus. I'm going to play this video and then there's one thing I want to highlight for you once it runs through a little bit. You can see we're moving up north toward the patient's head, over that psoas muscle. The first little trick I want you to identify, we talked about the two main places, around the psoas muscle and around the iliac vessel. But every once in a while, what can happen is the appendix will live right here in this area, right kind of at the top of where the psoas muscle meets the iliac crest. So what I like to do is as I scan through, just as I get just to the top of that iliac crest, my eye goes over to that patient's right side and I look to see if I can see that circular tube that is the appendix. Let's run through one more time, systematically up and down, up to the level of the umbilicus. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide my probe over toward the patient's uh, midline so I can really get the those uh, iliac vessels in view. And we're going to do the same kind of thing that we did before. Slide down toward the patient's feet, up toward their head, up to the level of the umbilicus, the top part of that box, and then slide that probe down. Let this run one more time because I want to point out an important feature for you here. Right here, we can see those iliac vessels really nicely, huh? And then there doesn't seem to be too much interference right above this part. But as we start to get out of the cecum and into the ascending colon, we're going to see air. 
right coming into view and right there okay so that's the spot so here we can see that that air exists right around here those hyperechoic dots that are sort of forming line that says to us we're in ascending colon what i want to do then is direct my attention right in this area because now we're going to sort of see hopefully the border between cecum and ascending colon is where the appendix will come off and be visualized march our way up we now still see that air. It says we're in ascending colon. We're gonna move all the way up to level of the umbilicus, defining the ceiling of that box, and slide all the way up and down, looking for either a circle, if we see in cross-section, or a tube, if we see it flat. Wonderful. All right, now, there's a couple of features that we need to have on our study to prove to us that it is positive appendicitis. And each of these you can do in turn. So the first thing is, a tubular, non-compressible, blind ending loop. Remember that little snake or that little balloon? That's greater than six or seven millimeters, depending upon which textbook you read. And this is probably the most important thing, the itis that is part of appendicitis. Because you can imagine that there might be someone walking around who's got a six millimeter appendix, but doesn't have the disease. The itis is the inflammation of the appendix. And we're gonna show you how to identify that. That's probably comparable to the fat stranding that we have visualized on CT scan. So this is a transverse view, of course, with a high frequency of linear probe right in the area, visualizing nice of those iliac vessels. And we're gonna march upward, looking for a circle or a tube. And oh, pops right into view here. Have it run through one more time. Now we wish that it's gonna be this easy every time, but if you go to this program and search, and it's there, you're gonna find it. In here, we do find something really pretty interesting. We find that hyperechoic fecolith with its dirty shadow, that is the appendicitis. You saw that it didn't specifically identify and write on those five criteria slide that you need to have a fecolith. If you have one, then that's really useful to help you highlight the appendix, but it is not necessary. We do have a little bit of a dirty shadow here, um, and that highlights the point that a fecolith may or may not shadow. In addition, if you look really closely, you actually can see that there's a double wall as we start to blur all and get some inflammation between the, the layers of the appendix. Now, this is what I was talking about, the itis part. Right in this area here, you can see how we're starting to see a little bit more hyperechoic bit. That's the itis of the appendicitis. So let's move on. Once again, we can see that dirty shadow. Bring in another view. We have a really nice wide field view with the iliac vessels uh, nicely visualized. We're going to march our way upward. And we start to see another circle that appears here just to on the right of the screen of those iliac vessels. So I make my way through this and I sort of say, well, maybe this could this possibly be a branch vessel? It doesn't really look like it, but I have to prove that this is the appendix. So I put color flow on and we can see that our vessels light up and that structure off just on its right of the screen does not line up. And my next step is to sort of say, is this something that is within the range of abnormal? You can see here that we've identified this structure is almost uh, seven millimeters. That's right in the range of the abnormal appendix. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate my probe. So as it is now, I have it listed uh, laying in the transverse plane. I'm gonna rotate my marker up toward the patient's head so I can turn this circle into a tube. Here we are, we can see that tube pointed right here. Let's highlight it for you. That's the appendix. And then you actually can see another kind of little wall around there. And that's kind of where we're sort of saying, oh, we're starting to get some inflammation in that wall. Let me measure this to confirm that what I turned over is exactly the same structure. You can see here that it's, whoa, now we're definitely over what would be normal for an appendix. And we can start to see, this is really pretty early on, we can start to see a little bit of that itis right here. All right. To highlight that same point, I want to bring out more of that itis. You know, if we were in the Twitter world, we'd sort of like hashtag itis. Here are our iliac vessels. And then off on the right side, 
we can see this circular structure with a little bit of more hyperechoic blurriness surrounding it. Now, once again, I go through the process in my mind to ensure that this structure I'm looking at isn't a branch vessel. And just to sort of show that those do exist, see like right up here? Those are little branch vessels. And if you move your probe up and down, you'll see that those blend together. If we put color on here, we can see that those vessels, that little bit lights up here. But then that structure that we're pointing at that's over on the right, that does not. That says to me, not a branch vessel. And I have to really be concerned that this is something like appendicitis. It could also be a bowel wall. So we're going to have to provide some downward pressure. You can see I've written up here with compression. And I do this in my mind each time. I identify the areas where I would most likely see the appendix. I see if I can see a circle or a tube. Press color to make sure that it's not a branch vessel. Then my next step is I squeeze it. If I can squeeze it out, then it could be something like terminal ileum or a little bit of small bowel. I see this structure here on the right side, right here. It's near the iliac vessels. It's a circular tube pressure, tube uh, appearing structure that with compression doesn't change. I measure it. It's over the normal for the appendix. You can see here it's seven and a half millimeters. Then I'm going to start to rotate to see if I can get into better view. And you can see that we're starting to straighten this tube out a little bit. You can see it's going to go kind of underneath the vessels. And this really highlights, once I've measured this, see how much wider it is? 0.9 centimeters now. This highlights the idea of tip appendicitis. So we have to follow that tubular structure all the way to its end to sort of say for sure that we don't have swelling at that end. Because you can imagine someone may have just the dilatation at the very distal piece, whereas the midpoint of the appendix may be a normal size. So we wouldn't want to call someone who has right lower quadrant abdominal pain and a normal appearing midpoint normal if we haven't fully visualized the entire length of the appendix. Let's run this through one more time. Um, I, I've put a couple of videos together here to show you the fact that as we move from bladder to iliac vessels, we may very well see something that looks appendicitis-like with some surrounding fluid. It's important in your mind to remember that children have a much higher likelihood of presenting with perforated appendicitis than adults do. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first of which is that children may poorly localize their point of pain. What I mean by that is it kind of hurts all over. They always point to their belly. Maybe they have some other symptoms like limping or trouble urinating, and they might not specifically be able to point to that right lower quadrant. So as we march our way through here, we're going over toward the patient's right, iliac vessels we'll see, and then we start to see this irregularly shaped fluid filled region. And we start to see a tubular structure within there. So this whole video is going to run through a couple more times where we highlight some of the features we see here, bladder, and I'm going to freeze it right here. And then right here is where we're going to show you that we have those iliac vessels, huh? Right here and right here on the screen. So that says to us we should look really pretty carefully in that region. We'll let this continue running. And I'm going to freeze this one more time. Because this is not something I showed you before on the normal view. What we have here is we have this area right in here. And that's fluid filled. Well, we shouldn't have this irregular pointy fluid filled region in this area. So we start to worry that this is free fluid from a ruptured appendicitis. March our way through. In here, oh, we got a little glimpse that's going to come back of a circular structure right here, right in this, oh, hold on, oops. We're going to have that circular structure right in here. And then you can also see that there's a little bit more here. Let's see what we got here. We'll let this layer out a little bit. And we're going to scan through this so you can see it actually isn't just one single circle, but it's a tube as it lays out. And that kind of blends right into that area of free fluid. One more time, march over, iliac vessels, free fluid. And then we see that tubular structure coming into view right here. All right. And then here, do you see how we have some of that blurriness, that hyperechoic? 
that itis that's necessary for appendicitis. It's important to remember that someone who has ruptured appendicitis may not have an abnormally dilated appendix in terms of size. And the reason for that is if fluid has leaked out, the appendix may shrink back down. But if you do see fluid in the right lower quadrant in young children, you have to be very suspicious that there's something like a ruptured appendicitis there. So we highlighted before the idea that if you have a high frequency linear probe, you may only get a narrow field of view and it's kind of difficult to see some neighboring structures that will help ground you. So what I did in this particular uh, patient was I changed over to the curvilinear probe. That way we can see the appendix on the screen and that pocket of free fluid here. So I measure that structure. We can see that it's very, very dilated. And we have the hashtag itis of appendicitis. Highlighting here that we have that area of free fluid, very dilated appendix. Now, one other thing that we can see in some, child, some children who have right lower quadrant abdominal pain is probably something like mesenteric adenitis. So here I have highlighted for you what those look like. Those nodes look a little bit like beans and may exist in the right lower quadrant as a result of some infectious etiology. In addition, they may have that same kind of appearance that I showed you before where they have the dilated bowel that appears uh, with hyperechoic dots inside to say the beginning of gastroenteritis. The last thing that I'm going to discuss today is pyloric stenosis. And I want you to remember pi. That's gonna be incredibly important as a clue to remember some measurements for our study here today. When we consider pyloric stenosis, the history usually involves a three to five week old infant with non-bilious, non-bloody projectile emesis. So we wheel our ultrasound in with our warm gel. Those young children are very, very sensitive to cold gel. We're going to take our probe, once again, the high frequency linear probe, point the marker toward the patient's right, right below the xiphoid process. Now I tell you around nine o'clock, but every once in a while I like to orient the probe just a touch, make it closer to kind of 830. And the standard placement is just below the xiphoid. But what can happen is in that position, we can get some stomach air or we can get some transverse colon that's kind of getting in the way and make it a little bit more difficult. So here's a tip for you. Raise that probe up just a touch and then you're gonna angle the beam a little bit toward the patient's feet. What that's gonna do is it'll allow you to visualize and shoot right through the patient's liver using the great acoustic window and get an even better, clearer view. So here we have a still image uh, to identify the pylorus. And over on the right side of the screen, what we see is the stomach. Up on the, above the top and just over the left will be liver. Coming from the stomach will be the muscular wall, the pylorus, and then the pyloric channel. So as we saw for iliocolic interception, when we're looking at bowel, we know that there's gonna be fluid inside bowel and stomach, and air can appear as hyperechoic dots or reverberating lines. So this video will run through. This is a child who does not have pyloric stenosis. And we're gonna see here that the stomach, which is off on the right here, will contract as food gets expelled from the stomach through the pylorus into small bowel. We can see movements as the patient swallows, coming off on the top right of the screen, and food is pushed through to make way for more food. Those hyperechoic dots are air contained within the food contents. They will pass directly through the pylorus and then out into the small bowel. Now off on the left side of the screen, there's a tiny little blip right in here. That's the gallbladder, and that's gonna be your target organ for this study. Gallbladder often resides on the medial border of the stomach, right next to the pylorus. So if you're having a little bit of difficulty identifying the pylorus, you can find your gallbladder, move a little bit more medially, and those two should be really close together. As the patient drinks, what ends up happening is the stomach will dilate, and you can really clearly see that inner wall of the stomach 
as it's highlighted by the anechoic fluid. Now, glucose water works much better than formula or breast milk just because there's less material that's, uh, that's within it. But if you don't have it available, then the patient can simply feed and you'll be able to see movement of stomach contents. So here's our normal stomach. We can see a wide open pyloric channel. And of course, someone with pyloric stenosis has a much more thickened pylorus. The numbers you have to keep in mind. Remember I talked to you before about pi. Well, we're going to talk about the length and the thickness. And so here, there's two measurements. You don't need both, but we do have the muscular layer above and below the channel. Keep that pi in your mind. And we can see here that the thickness, pyloric stenosis, is going to be greater than 3, and the length greater than 14 millimeters. So that's where that pyloric stenosis is going to come into our mind. So 3.14 right? Can't be more than 3 in thickness or more than 14 or 15 in terms of length. In addition, what we can do once we identify the pylorus is we can rotate the probe. So instead of having the marker pointed toward the patient's right, we can point the marker up toward the patient's head. What that does is it changes that tubular appearance into a circle. And then we'll have, we can measure the outer wall uh, that's going to be the green on the right image, and that's going to be the pylorus. So here, I'm going to have a video run for you, a couple of, uh, sorry, a couple of still images run for you. And then bringing in the pylorus. So the couple of things that I'm going to show you here. First, we'll freeze this image, and here is the gallbladder. Remember, that's our target organ. I'm going to look over toward the right on the screen. You can see here that we're bringing in this area right here, and that's the muscular layer, and then the other muscular layer. Trace this back, and then we're going to see stomach. Here we can see some hypercoke material. That's going to be air that's contained within the stomach. Let's let this run. And so this is me just fanning up and down, bringing this nicely into view. Once I can get a nice picture, then I can start to measure and see if I see the pylorus clearly. In addition, if I see stomach material that passes directly through this pyloric channel, then I feel much, then I say, in addition to simply feeling better, I can say for sure the person doesn't have pyloric stenosis because food makes its way through. If there's no passage of material, then we have to start to measure to make sure that the person does not have thickened muscular layer or elongated muscular layer. What can happen is the walls may not be thick and the channel might not be long, but food doesn't make its way through. In that particular case, we may have someone who has a pylorus spasm. We'll just hold our probe on the pylorus, allow that spasm to make its way through. It can take even a few minutes for that to happen. Once that pylorus relaxes, we'll see food pass its way through. Let's see here. So we march this way just tilting, angling the probe to bring it nicely into view. Freeze our image. We can see an elongated, uh, elongated pylorus. I always like to take a still image shot first and then measure after to make sure that I'm measuring in the appropriate spot. We can see we have, on these two here, we have a thickened muscular layer and I have an elongated muscular layer above the three 0.14 that has a lower limit of normal. All right, so now I want to use this image to show you that sometimes positioning is not exactly as I described. In the very beginning of the lecture, we talked about laying the child on the parent. And so in that particular case, the patient is totally supine. But what sometimes happens is we don't get a great visualization. So what we can do is we can rotate the child, rotate the child into right lateral decubitus position. What that hopefully does is pull some of the air up toward the body of the stomach and brings the pylorus into greater view. With lots of feeding, however, the stomach can fold over on itself, push the pylorus back and make it a little bit difficult to visualize. That's where the rotation of the probe just a touch 
can really save us here. You can see on this image that we have the wall of the stomach nicely identified. And uh, the pylorus isn't exactly as I described to you. You can see it's more vertically in orientation. It's probably as the stomach has started to fold over. But we see this interesting little bit right here. It looks a little bit like a nipple. So keep that in your mind for one moment. And I'm going to show you that we measured the pylorus in this patient here. And it is above the upper limit of normal of 14. It measures at 18 millimeters. That definitely makes this pylora, pyloric stenosis. But I want to bring this up to you here, just like we talked about. This little bump, this is the antral nipple sign. And this is that the, as the pylorus has gotten so thickened, there was essentially no more room for it to expand, uh, extend distally, and it extends proximally and bulges into the stomach itself, so creating that nipple appearance. That's something you may very well identify, particularly in bad cases of pyloric stenosis. A couple of tips to get some nice visualization, just as we described before, turn the child into right lateral decubitus that may very well pull some of the air up toward the body of the stomach gives some better visualization. The gallbladder is going to appear right near where the pyloric channel sort of exits the stomach. So if you're a little bit lost, then you can find the gallbladder and then move a little bit more medial. And then glucose water will give a really nice outlining of the internal stomach wall. Works a little bit better than uh, breast milk or formula. So in summary, all these applications together. The critical feature starts with positioning and comfort for the children. Moving on, warm gel will make all the difference to make sure the child is as comfortable as possible. For appendicitis, you're really not going to be able to get a good exam without morphine and good pain control because what you really need to do is provide all that downward pressure to help narrow that subcutaneous tissue and bring the appendix closer to the surface where you have even better visualization. Graded compression as you squeeze out that bowel air will be really useful for appendicitis visualization and into susception. Your two areas where you're gonna most likely identify the appendix are the psoas muscle and around the iliac vessels. And then the gallbladder will serve as your target organ for both intussusception and pyloric stenosis to help guide you to the appropriate spots. Here's a list of some nice articles which highlight these point of care applications and I've gained a good amount of assistance from a number of physicians who helped with imaging and drawings and my family who have served as the models. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck scanning.